here. Uh, no, no, this is about making science cool, but, um, but I do have to say that I did walk in here somewhat in, unprepared in my, the bios that okay, I should have had one, last week. And I've, entirely of my own fault were finally given to me a few seconds ago. Uh, and so I will read from them rather than having uh, memorized them to some degree. Uh, our format, as always, will be that uh, each of our uh, panelists will make an opening statement. In fact, there's a uh, slide set or visual set that each of them has prepared that will run through. Uh, uh, then I'm going to have them uh, discourse among one another, query one another, ad hominem attacks are perfectly welcome, of course. Um, no, they're not, no. Um, and, um, and then I'll open it up to the, uh, uh, you, the adoring public, for comments, questions, and so forth. So to my immediate right and to your left would be Dr. Frank Summers, who's an astrophysicist at the uh, Space Telescope uh, Science Institute at Baltimore, Maryland. He received his undergraduate degree in physics from uh, Virginia Tech and his uh, master's and PhD from uh, UC Berkeley um, in astronomy. After receiving his degrees, he did his research on cosmology and galaxy formation in Princeton and, and Columbia University, specializing in supercomputer simulations. He then shifted his career emphasis uh, to the uh, public presentation of astronomy while at the Hayden Planetarium in New York before uh, joining Space Telescope. Um, next is Chris Ford. Uh, Chris is uh, part of uh, one of the coolest groups I know, Pixar. He's uh, currently the RenderMan Business Director at Pixar Animation Studios with over 20 years experience in computer graphics, software development and media production uh, technology, formerly at Autodesk, Elias, Silicon Graphics, and Wavefront Technologies. Chris has been a product manager for most of the modeling animations and rendering of software tools used in professional uh, feature film special effects animation in space and astronomy visualization. Chris is also president of the Mount Diablo Ast uh, Astronomical Society, a member of the board of directors of the uh, Astronomical Society of the Pacific, or ASP, and is an, a noted astrophotographer. And uh, he's got a very cool collection of telescopes if anybody wants to talk to him about that afterwards. Eric Hansen, uh, next up, is a visual uh, effects designer specializing in the creation of digital environments and effects for feature films. Eric Hansen has worked with noted visual effects house such as uh, Digital Domains, Sony, uh, so Sony Imagine Works, uh, Dream Quest Images, uh, and Walt Disney Feature Animation. His credits include The Fifth Element, one of my favorite films, by the way, I love that film from 1997, Bicentennial Man, <laughs> Castaway, <laughs> Hollow Man, Mission to Mars, Spider-Man, and, uh, and, and Atlantis, as well as many special uh, venue films. In addition to the visual effects classes at USC, Hansen has, held, has led courses on advanced effects uh, techniques at Silicon uh, Studios and Noman uh, School of Visual Effects uh, and is a member of the Visual Effects Society. Above all, Hansen wishes he could sleep more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got um, the long bio, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Frank, I think we're just going to go right down the... Oh, you missed Jonathan. Oh, did I miss Jonathan? Oh, it's, uh, I'm so oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep, sorry. Um, Jonathan, uh, software development. Uh, Jonathan Fay is a software developer and, and uh, passionate uh, amateur astronomer who develops uh, software for astronomy, imaging, and visualization. He is the principal software architect for Worldwide Telescope at Microsoft uh, Research. In the uh, four years since uh, Worldwide Telescope has launched, uh, he it has uh, been used. By, it has been used by more than f uh, seven million people, ranging from students to astro astronomy researchers and on platforms ranging from, ranging from uh, web browsers to giant full dome digital planetariums. Okay, sorry about that, Jonathan. Um, so, onwards. Frank, you're up first. Go for it. Okay. Got my slides? <laughs> it's plugged into his machine. Let's, let's. How are we using this one now? No, no, no. no, we no, need no. To, I need your... Can I get this mic so I can yeah. actually see my slides while I'm talking about them? You see, we're all media professionals here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you got that? All right, those aren't my slides. No, they're not. <laughs> exactly. Don't be nervous. Everybody's watching you. 
Uh, I'm an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the IMAX film that we worked on there, uh, Hubble 3D. It came out in 2010. It's uh, done over 35, maybe 40 million in box office worldwide since then. There we go. All right. And on the film, I got to be a writer, science advisor, and scientific visualization supervisor. Uh, this is my entire team at Space Telescope. We had four people working on the film at ST. Uh, we cannot hope to compete with Hollywood, which has thousands of people on the films like Avatar, okay? So what can we do? Well, we don't have fantasy, but we have reality. And an example of that, what I do is I take computer simulations, and this is it, uh, what is in the computer simulation, a whole bunch of particles. And if you see that, you can say, okay, those are two galaxies. All right, but if I go, oops, I didn't have that, that's the wrong slide. Oh, crap, I gave you the wrong slide. But if you render it correctly, it actually looks really, really cool, and I don't know how I got the wrong slide in there. Um, uh, so I will forget this one. All right, I do really cool computer simulations um, uh, where I render them correctly. The particle stuff looks like crap. I only got the crap. I didn't get the, the good slide to go behind it. Um, and if you t really, really w w be scientifically accurate to what's being done in the simulation, you can really show not only to the scientists what's going on in the simulation, but it makes it beautiful for the public. Um, so, for example, I can take these four images of galaxy collisions taken by Hubble. I can model them with uh, supercomputer simulations and get three, uh, four proportions like that. And with one simulation, I can show you how these four images are interconnected as one timestamp, time, one frame within a billion and a half year long movie of galaxies colliding. Uh, for the IMAX, we took this, uh, our piece to resistance sequence takes the Orion Nebula here. We pull off. Uh, and then we model it in 3D uh, using all the scientific knowledge about it. As I like to say, we, have, we use scientific knowledge where we have it. We use scientific intuition when we don't have that. And when we still don't have that, we use artistic license, but it's always guided by an astrophysicist so that we can get the details. As you come in, you can see we've got this huge valley in here. Um, it's all a Maya model on this. This is the hard surface, the uh, part where we uh, have to uh, utilize our collaborators at NCSA, National Center for Supercomputing Applications. As you can see that in here, this whole cave in here is stuff that we have to create um, because, of course, Hubble can't see it. It's hidden from, uh, from our point of view. But what we do is we create the nebular surface by particles. We have millions of particles on top of that. We then composite on top of that the stars and all of the uh, gas clouds outside of it. And then we f fill in with the uh, Bauschox and Proplids and the uh, complete Milky Way in behind it so that we get a full uh, thing. Uh, we get a full model of this that takes you down and lets you experience the Hubble images in full 3D. Um, and of course, to make it really, really cool, when you do it in stereo 3D, you have to have the cool toys that they have at NCSA. This is us uh, doing the choreography for the camera for that. So I'm saying what we end up with is that we have truth as behind our beauty, and that makes it even cooler uh, than if we just had beautiful pictures that we made up out of our uh, imaginations. Chris Ford. Okay, so after that, I'm the fake aliens guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, good first, uh, first slide, that's the last one. Okay, I'm not sure how the clicker works. Okay, so, um, so my name is Chris Ford from Pixar Animation Studios. When you think of Pixar, no doubt you think of us as a feature film studio, which of course we are, but you may not be aware that we also supply the rendering technology used in most feature films a lot of astronomical visualization, and have really um, you know, pushed and pioneered the visual effects revolution that's occurred over the past 20 years or so. Um, a lot of it, much of it is associated with the RenderMan technology, which is part of my group, uh, which essentially can produce images that are so real now that you can't distinguish them from reality, as you will see in any modern day movie. You, know, you just cannot see where the seams and the joins are. So, of course, I had to populate my slide full of certain recognizable characters who have a certain theme to them. Okay, so this is something you might recognize. You know, here we have that spaceship um, on the bottom. And here, of course, we have another one from uh, Prometheus. Some of you may have seen this movie. It's just out. Uh, an excellent example of the state of the art in photorealistic visualization of in this case, obviously, uh, science and science fiction type themes. 
Um, the theme I'm going to really play on here is that there is a relationship between astronomy, visualization, and Hollywood that is actually quite significant, but very rarely commented on. Uh, and you're going to see this as I just give you this kind of conceptual background uh, to what I'm talking about. Here you can see images from some of Pixar's movies, um, the uh, Axiom from Wally. -E. And the bottom image also came from Wally, -E, and I wanted to show you this just to show you that the technology isn't only just about rendering spaceships and solid surfaces and nasty, slimy aliens, but it's also about rendering physical effects that essentially simulate the physics of how things work inside of a computer, albeit whether it's a solar flare. Of course, uh, as uh, Frank just pointed out, it could be a galaxy simulation. Ultimately, all of the, this data needs to be represented in a form that is uh, you know, as realistic as possible to the way we might actually see it in real life. I'm also an astrophotographer, really interested in um, applying these types of techniques to images that you can capture for a telescope. That's actually one of my telescopes, and you may just see this little swimming pool there. Um, everyone who does astrophotography has to have a pool to fall into at some point. Um, <laughs> but there are good techniques that you can use just to combine um, image, you know, basic images for a six-inch telescope like this uh, into different layers and produce animations uh, that can look really real. They don't have to go flying around like a Star Wars spaceship. Just a little motion can make things pop and give you a 3D kind of sense of being there, which uh, is really quite profound. So the, the real theme here, I just lost my slide, is that Hollywood and visualization uh, and astronomy are actually intertwined. And uh, that has been a theme. You know, the top sequence came from uh, the roving Mars uh, sequence. I'm sure many of you have seen this, you know, when Spirit and Opportunity landed. Obviously another shot we have here from Prometheus, um, cowboys and aliens, and um, a shot from the Haydn cosmic collisions sequence here. But all of these just show how photorealistic rendering technology can really bring um, the far universe to you. And uh, we'll talk more on it. I'm going to do a laptop swap here. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm Eric Hansen. I uh, have been working with SETI for about two years now, I think, and uh, mostly through the collaboration that SETI has had with USC. And uh, I'm in the school of the film school, the School of Cinematic Arts, in the uh, digital arts program in animation. So one thing that I've uh, been able to do or have done uh, even prior to the SETI uh, relationship is foster a bridge between our digital arts students and the sciences. So I'm kind of the, the poster boy, as it, as it were, uh, for kind of trying to, to create these bridges. That's one thing I, I think I'd like to talk about today a bit, um, is just the, the role of artists in popularizing science and you know where the value is, where the limits are, what the issues may be. Um, but just very quickly here, um, it was nice to hear that little smattering of applause on Fifth Element. You know, the funny thing is, to this day, I still get fan mail about this film. And um, this is one of the first films, big films, that I worked on. It just kind of fueled my career. And uh, it was a great opportunity back then. It was really a great feel-good production. We had a terrific time doing the creative work on this film. But uh, I have a background as an architect, so I brought in a lot of uh, architectural skills to, uh, to create the cityscape in this particular film. Um, and also uh, other environments, so I'm basically a big environment uh, creator. This is actually, this slide is out of order. What you would uh, prefer to see here would be, actually, I wanted to show this first and then show what it is, which is Tom Hanks in Castaway. He's actually not in Fiji. He's just up the street from his house in Pacific Palisades. But, uh, but nonetheless, the, these kind of uh, uh, tricks that, that go on quite frequently. But about, uh, so I, I've worked in feature film for probably about 17, 18 years now, but about five years ago, I formed my own small boutique company uh, to really research a lot of this great emerging technology that's coming out and to kind of fuel my interest, my lifelong interest in science. Um, because I feel like in feature film, you know, people have horse blinders on about just wanting to do feature work. And there's so much that could be done to talk about real world stories. 
And that's what I'm trying to do in my small company is do some projects that really capitalize on some of the great emerging technology that's out there with projects that matter in the real world. Um, I think uh, between my uh, business partner and myself, I think uh, he comes from visual effects, I think we calculated we destroyed New York City, I think about seven times between the two of us. <laughs> and it was just getting a little tiresome. It's like, let's do something constructive instead of destructive. So in any case, but that's one thing that, that uh, we do a fair amount about. We uh, were one of the early pioneers in a thing called gigapixel photography. Now, it's kind of funny talking about this to astronomers because astronomers have had giant images forever. They probably think of this as very cute, but, uh, but again, we're doing this on a terrestrial uh, basis, and we're able to put these images out on the web for the first time. Um, it's become a bit uh, ubiquitous now, but just to show you one uh, example of this, first of all, we do a lot of uh, work with computational photography and kind of novel forms of photography. So here is the, uh, you may know this as the National Ignition Facility out at Livermore, a uh, wonderful fusion. Uh, project and you know we have the resolution to really go in deep and really examine you know just the wonderful wonderful detail that's in this device um, so that's one one form of photography we do but another one would be gigapixel and we do a lot of work um, recently in the Himalaya I just got back from Everest Space Camp about six weeks ago uh, shooting but this is an earlier image uh, where we can uh, see a terrestrial subject here but we can also drill down fairly deeply into this image. Uh, and this is a, the result of about a thousand photographs that have been assembled together. The beautiful thing about this from a science level, especially earth sciences, is that we can go in and we can see uh, geologic strata. This is the ancient seabed layering um, that again, just conventional photographs don't really convey. So these are some of the things that, uh, that we do. And then I have one other little demo loaded. This is another thing using, we do a lot of work with cultural heritage. This is a uh, piece of Native American rock art, but done with a special type of photography where we take, again, several hundred images and then I can move a light in post around and actually look at kind of the relief and the reveal um, on this. So archeologists love this kind of thing. So these are examples of uh, areas of research and we've actually worked with Microsoft Research that Jonathan is from on uh, several of these uh, topics. But in any case, that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm up to. And, uh, but again, uh, we're happy to be here. Thanks. I'm Jonathan Fay, um, the principal architect on something called Worldwide Telescope. Uh, about uh, uh, 19 years ago, um, I had two offers, one to work for a Hollywood special effects movie studio and the other to work uh, um, as uh, what I told my wife was like a, a visual basic sequel prostitute consultant for Microsoft <laughs> Consulting Services. Um, and uh, my wife wanted to live in Seattle, so uh, I thought that I had basically taken the road to hell uh, from all this gorgeous effects and my 3D and imaging me background. Uh, but uh, luckily Microsoft is, has a lot of disciplines in there and I slowly made my way into Microsoft research and I got to work with uh, some people like Alvy Ray Smith who was one of the co-founders of Pixar and we did a lot of cool things with imaging and as uh, I started meeting a lot of people there uh, one of the people who really made a lot of impressions was a, a, a gentleman, and a real gentleman named Jim Gray who was a Turing award winning scientist, invented a lot of the technologies we take for granted nowadays. Um, and one of the things that uh, we worked with early on was something called TerraServer, which was uh, being able to put the whole, uh, you know, the Earth online and be able to zoom in and see your house from space. This is sort of the, the, the whole first uh, step of the way that, you know, led us to things like, you know, Bing Maps and Google Earth and, and Worldwide Telescope. Um, Jim uh, got tired of all the lawsuits that was involved in that and realized that astronomy data was worthless. So no one would ever sue uh, when you're doing research in that area. And so he jumped into something called Sky Server. That? What's that? Can I object to that? I'm sorry, yeah. it's worthless. Um, but uh, uh, he, he, of course, said tongue in cheek. But he worked with um, uh, some folks, uh, um, you know, in the campus that uh, Frank works at, at uh, um, on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and kind of worked to kind of revolutionize how astronomy uh, uh, would be done in terms of as a big data science. Uh, and that's when uh, he got involved with Curtis Wong, who I also worked with, 
um, in trying to make it an accessible thing because they're getting all these amazing images and they wanted to make it accessible so that people could see it. And so not just sci uh, the scientists, but also the general public and democratize science. Um, and so I had been, uh, again, trying, you know, uh, working my way back into the 3D world where I came from and had been working on a way of visualizing this. And um, so uh, Curtis and I got together with Jim and decided to put together this project where we are going to be able to let people fly through this virtual universe and use video game technology uh, to be able to uh, start looking at things. So I'll, I'll go through some of my slides. This right here is one of a newly released WISE uh, images. And Worldwide Telescope, like uh, uh, with the technology that we've developed for this multi-resolution zooming, as you saw in the Andes, well, they were showing gigapixel images. Well, we were able to process terapixel images. So the entire sky, one million pixels by one million pixels. So you can basically, without adaptive optics, it's the highest resolution you can get from ground-based telescopes. And going, going in uh, to be able to see anywhere in the sky uh, in a seamless panorama and be able to have a fluid action. Unfortunately, I, I just brought slides, but you'll, you can come by the booth later on and, and, and see this in action or, or download it yourself for free. But uh, here's like WISE, um, but you can also, uh, we wanted to bring uh, the ability for people to not just see the typical Hubble pictures they saw in visual, but be able to look at the different wavelengths of light. So you can come and see an X-ray image of the sky and then cross-fade it over and see that there's this beautiful nebula behind it in the visible range and learn a lot more about what's actually happening uh, in the sky by bringing this together. Uh, but we also wanted to be able to simulate the universe in 3D. So we gave people the ability to fly through this, this beautiful universe all the way from a, a sub-meter resolution. You can actually see, you know, uh, 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 you know, cars and uh, people walking in the scene and zoom back out to the large scale structure of the universe and out past the Big Bang. Um, you can orbit and uh, fly with the International Space Station and relive the glory days of the shuttle. Um, you can look at every single object that we know about uh, orbiting the sun and orbiting the planets around the sun and speed up time and watch as they all are modeled in, in their orbits. Um, you can look at a satellite picture of Mars where you can zoom in and see boulders that are at human scale. And then you can look at the panorama. Ooh, where did it go? Ah, well, missing slide again. But then you can look at the panorama actually taken by one of those Mars explorers. You can see the tracks on, on that rover. And then you can look from that rover and see the same rocks that were there and it really puts you in place there on Mars to really kind of uh, explore it. Um, so you know with with people uh, especially uh, kids that we want to be able to uh, reach to get into STEM careers we need to make things uh, that compete visually and with impact with you know Xbox and Halo and and these sort of things like that that the types of movies that are out there and bring real science to them and make it so that it's interesting and cool for them. And, uh, you know, take a look at it. And when you see, um, uh, go on to YouTube and look for Worldwide Telescope Connect. And uh, at a conference about a year ago, I'm using the Connect interface to fly through the universe with my hands, sort of like Tom Cruise in Minority Report. And when you look at that and your kids look at you and say, Dad, that's cool. <laughs> then you, you know you've gotten below three Kelvin. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right, can I comment on? So uh, I'm going to ask each of you to perhaps comment and, uh, and reflect on anything that one of the other panelists or other of the panelists may have said. Frank, I think you want right. to I was, go I was just going to immediately comment on what uh, Jonathan said, is that when we did our first IMAX short film, uh, in 2003 we did a, a three-minute film called Hubble Galaxies Across Space and Time. And in it, we took the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and we sli uh, sliced it up and we actually flew through it in 3D. And we, um, as a short film, it doesn't play in feature uh, across the country. Um, so it was playing at the Maryland Science Center every day. And we got the feedback from the people at MSC that the audience was walking out saying, that was really cool, but I wish they'd showed us the real Hubble data. Okay, because of what these guys do, the audience 
thinks that every time they see a computer graphics that it's Hollywood fantasy. And so what the folks at Maryland Science Center felt they had to do was put up a disclaimer in front of it. Everything you're about to see is derived from Hubble data because there was nothing that wasn't from Hubble in that three minute film. Every single pixel came from Hubble or was derived from Hubble data, but the audience assumed it was faked. So you guys are doing too good a job, okay? <laughs> no, I yeah. said no ad hominem in the tax, no. <laughs> okay, Chris. Yeah, actually a point I wanted to make is that uh, these visualizations, uh, you know, to be real, to be true and faithful to the original data are only as good as that original data, right? And I think that one of the most important developments over the past decade has been the quality of visual image sensors on astronomical equipment and spacecraft. You know, um, I was lucky enough to attend the launch of Curiosity, for example, last November. You know, and this will land on Mars in uh, August. And, you know, this has high-definition cameras on board. Now, the existing rovers spirit an opportunity of high-def cameras as well. In fact, Curiosity will send streaming video back from Mars. So the amount of density, you know, the density of information in that image is profound. Now, it's the same with the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, this is sending back extremely high resolution imagery, which gives you a lot more material to work with uh, when it comes to actually visualizing these scenes and really blurring that boundary between the cinematic quality that I showed earlier and the real quality of the data that you're receiving. Eric, do you want to uh, chime sure. in? Yes. Uh, well, one thing I'll say, uh, first of all, I have to uh, give a little mutual admiration to Frank there. The, the Hubble film, I think, uh, addresses one of the key things that I've tried to do in a lot of my work, which is show scale. And when you think of the universe, there's nothing of any more, you know, magnificent scale. And it's a, we're trying to do that with terrestrial subjects, and gigapixel photography that we're doing now is one way to kind of address that and give an understanding of that. Uh, Worldwide Telescope would be another where you could really express the true scale, but... Um, so I think there's certain challenges in uh, conveying some of the, the subject matter that we're talking about. Um, but in any case, I think the, uh, uh, the other thing, again, to point on is uh, the role of the artist and, you know, in science. And uh, there's, uh, um, this is something that Chris knows from visual effects, there's artists and there's technicians that create these films. And uh, we both have hands on the steering wheel, you know, of the boat. Um, but much in the same way that I've experienced at USC is that we, you know, there are certain challenges in trying to, uh, I will say that science comes first because what we're trying to do is take the 10% of a grant uh, for communication of that research and do a, a skillful job of it using the skills that my students have. So science does come first, but the, uh, we've had some very interesting experiences in the last number of years with students kind of taking residency with a research scientist and trying to get a grasp on you know, what the nature of the work is and how it's best represented to the public. So um, that's an ongoing subject also, is the role of art and science and what the veracity of each should be and uh, you know, how successful, but overall of how to make it, as you say, cool and, and very uh, compelling uh, for the public. So that's a, another thing that, that I pay a lot of attention to as well. Uh, Jonathan, you want to weigh in? One of, one of the things that, um, it was a story uh, told to me in the Grand Tetons National Park by a ranger that when, uh, I believe it was a French exploration team came to survey the Grand Tetons, they had the a new uh, field of photography and uh, they were going to, they actually photographed uh, the mountains. But they didn't trust this new technology and so they actually took artists along to paint the mountains to get the real story. Um, and I think that, uh, like Frank said, when people look at things right now, they're oftentimes the, the line between special effects and what's real science um, uh, is, is uh, often um, uh, sometimes blurred. And I think that that is one of the dangers as we're making science cool. If the science data looks like science data, then it's obvious that it's science data. But if we uh, glitz it up too much, we may verge on actually being mistaken for special effects. But on the other hand, if we don't do that, we're gonna lose the audience because they're expecting that sort of, of punch. And we want to, I mean, from my standpoint, um, when uh, my wife uh, uh, um, spent a lot of time at home with me at work over weekends and evenings as we built Worldwide Telescope, and uh, one day um, I played her this tour made by this six-year-old 
who um, was able to basically tell about the Ring Nebula and the Hubble image of the Ring Nebula that he loved so much with just such enthusiasm in my voice. And my wife said, this is why you spend all those nights and weekends. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's being able to engage people and get them excited for life about science through the work that we do. And, and I, you know, that's what matters. You know, I think if I can inject one, maybe part of the issue is maybe what photojournalism went through when editorial photography was altered. And everybody knows about the case of National Geographic moving the Egyptian uh, uh, pyramid. But, and I think they've had to take, they've had to learn that lesson of, again, of uh, accuracy and veracity of the work. And perhaps maybe we haven't done that in astronomy yet, that again, the lines get blurred and people don't know what, you know, where to, to draw that. So I don't know what to suggest, but other than, you know, this is, you know, indication that this is factual and not uh, uh, right. imagined. Right. I, I actually think there is a, um, I draw a distinction between what I would call analytical visualization, which essentially is using graphics to show how a phenomena or how a process actually, uh, you know, evolves and behaves. I think the galaxy merger example you showed are an excellent example of that. And photorealistic visualization, which actually is a more emotional, um, type of visualization that is really designed to impart in the sense of the viewer a sense of really being there. Obviously you want to communicate the accuracy of the data and uh, you know you don't lie about that uh, or you don't gloss over that but at the same time I do think it is valid uh, for the purposes of really exciting what I might call the YouTube generation um, that Giving them a sense of really experiencing what it is like to be out in the universe is just so key to the growth in public awareness in science and in the joy of that. When I'm doing astronomy outreach or when I'm showing people, for example, images from my telescope that are amplified by video, you know, you take in a video stream with a camera, you integrate all those images and you can actually get colorful images of the sky, which might have a laser pointer pointing to, for example. Um, you know, which is very different to just that very dim smudge you may see with your eye. And the emotional response is immediate and it's very, very powerful. And, uh, you know, I, the, the whole sky is full of big stuff, which is just too faint to see. Um, but which, with these types of techniques, uh, you know, you can amplify and you can bring them out and make people aware that they're actually part of a far greater whole so I come back to, you know, I think there is an emotional aspect of the engagement of the public with uh, astronomy and with the universe as a whole that I do not think should be underestimated or underrated. So Frank, yeah. I think you want to talk and then I'm going to open it up to, uh, for some questions. But Frank, first. Right. I, I would just echo that, um, that, that emotional aspect that, you know, space brings out the curiosity that we all had as kids, that sense of wonder. And that's what we really try to evoke. But I also want to be honest with you in that when I do a scientific visualization, I lie to you, okay? I cannot do it scientifically accurately or it would be generally boring. There are a tremendous length scales in the universe. There are tremendous um, different scales of mass, time that we have to skirt over um, in, in, some of, in the way we do things. We're showing you dark matter, which of course is not visible. We're showing you dark energy, which we don't even know what it is when we're trying to present these things. But the watchword to me is I, we try to lie as little as possible, we try and do it as much accurate as possible, and we try not to distort the message. Because for us, when we're trying to do educational materials, we want to make sure that the basic message is scientifically sound. Uh, I don't try for scientific accuracy, I strive for scientifically reasonable, and so that they, you get the message that yes, this is a three-dimensional universe, the nebula is structured, it's, it's full out, and you get the experience of it. Um, but I do have to admit that full scientific accuracy is a little beyond our grasp. All right, our volunteer Rick and myself will be uh, floating microphones around. He'll take that side, I'll take this, and we'll bounce back and forth. Pierre, first question. Uh, this is a question for Jonathan. Uh, the LSST is going to hopefully be built uh, within our lifetime, and one of the, part, part of their brief is to make their data public. They're going to take a picture of the entire universe viewed from the Earth every three days, and I'm wondering if you're talking to them to uh, allow this visualization to be uh, made public to the common mortal. Uh, they, they're making uh, part of... Um, public outreach and access to this image part of the uh, uh, plan for it. 
Uh, we do uh, have conversations with different individuals. Right now, we're not plugged in at a, a, a very high level uh, with that project. Um, but we are, we are um, uh, fo tracking what's going on with LSST. We are plugged in significantly um, with the, the Gaia project, which is another large scale project, which is really exciting for us because it's going to bring 3D, um, our Milky Way in 3D. So right now, when you fly around a worldwide telescope, there looks like there's a lot of stars because compared to what you can see with the human eye, uh, on a dark night, um, you know, the 135,000 stars in the Hipparchos catalog seems like a lot. But um, Gaia is going to capture one billion stars with a thousand times the spatial resolution of uh, what we currently have in Hipparchos, which is going to mean we can have a significant part of the Milky Way to model and fly to and visualize. And, uh, so, but uh, yes, for LSST, but also we're looking at Gaia as well, which will also uh, be in, the, in a similar type of time frame. But it, I think it is important to make that data available as widely as possible, uh, because it also, um, when you can't, uh, when there's so much of it, you need to be able to browse it seamlessly, or um, you, you know, a DMV form will never do to search that type of data. Right, and on the LSST, what it opens up is the time domain. You think of the Hubble images as one picture, uh, the night sky does change, and looking for asteroids and looking for other things, the time domain in astronomy has never really been exploited that well. A lot of things don't change on, on human time scales, but the things that do change, the variable stars, the, the movie sequences you can naturally create from the LSST data will have tremendous uh, possibility. And I've been in discussion with them about possibilities for doing these things, but the flood of data is even beyond what we've ever handled before. And both, both Gaia and LSST are going to provide that motion dimension uh, and the change dimension to it because they're um, looking at the same area of the sky over time to be able to find out you know, what all the pro proper motions of stars are, what their parallaxes are, what 3D is. And, and that's going to be amazing to be able to actually run the movie forward when you have all that data. So with the... Um with the goal of engaging, and the, the questions to all of you, with the goal of engaging the viewer and all the media that we're talking about here, is it necessary in the future that every, everything becomes interactive? I mean, 10 years out, is there some level of interactivity in everything that we attend or view? I mean, in other words, will, do you think in the future people, the viewer will be passive as in a dome film or in a, in a theater, or is there going to be some level of interactivity required to engage the viewer when you say something like the YouTube generation? Is yeah. that going to be necessary? I, th I think my, um, my, the co-creator of Worldwide Telescope, Curtis Wong, would, if he were on the panel right now, would be saying absolutely. Um, part of the, how we built WWT, he had a long history of working with like these PBS doc uh, documentaries like The Age of AIDS and um, several others regarding like the world economy and then the, um, uh, the Codex Lesser uh, from uh, Da Vinci. Uh, and he believed that there is a power, the, the real true education, you needed the model of being able to have the narrative that people could hear, but then that you would give them contextual exploration tools to be able to go through the data and, and, and hear more about the sto story, drill into it themselves where they can actively investigate and then give them access to all the data. And that the, the, those three elements together uh, lead for a, a complete education. And Worldwide Telescope, we added the, the, third, uh, the, the fourth element, which was then tell your story of what you've learned through a, you know, an authoring tool built into it. Yeah, I, I think uh, what's very powerful about Worldwide Telescope and the direction of tools like this are going is that uh, usually you know, to date when we think of the visualization of an astronomical theme, it's kind of like a fixed point in time, right? You know, as Frank said, you know, the time dimension is normally absent. You know, it's either a animation someone has done, it's on a DVD, it's an <coughs> illustration in a book, whatever it is, it's a fixed slice of time. But the reality is, is that the information is changing and being updated all the time. And I think the environments in which we see and observe that information need to be fluid and be in a continuous state of evolution. So that does dictate interactivity. 
uh, in the way you actually engage with that information so you can you know, observe it from different slices and different sections. And you know, the evolution of immersive technologies, technologies that enable you to you know, be inside that data you know, from a very sensory perspective, you know, are evolving very rapidly. You know, much of it driven by the commercial marketplace, you know, the needs of um, you know, not only films but in games and you know, photography. All of this is uh, driving this technology pretty quickly. So I think the answer is yes, interactivity is absolutely a part of this. Not only that, but because the sheer complexity of the information you're trying to look at, there is, you know, how else would you visualize it if you didn't have that? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a, uh, uh, a relative, an aunt, who was a, a pretty well-known Broadway star and, and movie actress. And about 10, 12 years ago, maybe earlier, when interactive cinema was being discussed, there was the point where audiences could dictate the ending of a film. And I described this to her rather excitedly, because at the time it sounded like you know, a really compelling idea. Oh no, she wanted no part of that. She was like, oh darling, no, 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 that is not you know, how it should be. So you know, there is this, this issue of, uh, I think the narrative film experience will live on you know, a very long life. But uh, the way that I see it is maybe that right now we have boundaries between what's interactive and what's non-interactive or narrative. And I think those boundaries will blur. So the media will evolve where you know, different types of experiences you may have digitally uh, could be interacted with, um, but I think uh, the classic form of narrative cinema, I believe anyway, coming from a film school, um, will probably live on for a while. I, I think there's uh, one other thing I'd like to add in that, is that things like uh, Stereo 3D, I think are the first uh, step in sort of this mass market of providing a, a another dimension that when, you're, when you have that 3D, the users, there's so much more information you're giving to the user that they can uh, focus on the areas that they're interested in looking at. And there's, you know, you look at a film like I've seen Avengers like, you know, 19 times now. And every time I see it, especially in 3D, you're, you're seeing all this action that's going on and everything. And you just can't keep up with all the information that's there. But it allows you to experience that in a different way. Uh, one of the things we're working on with Microsoft Research is this ability to actually have an experience where you track your eye and that the computation of, of the information that's being delivered is as the user is gazing in different areas, you're actually spending the time uh, c uh, computing that area with more detail and more information so that uh, and that sort of technology would eventually allow us so that you, you, the actresses and the director and everything like that still determine what the story is. But you have a much more interactive engagement with the universe as a participant rather than just watching one focus, one point of view, you know, one story evolving. Right, and let me just emphasize the narrative aspect of that. Um, because if I gave you the night sky for you to explore, uh, most of you don't know enough about the night sky to know where the cool places are. I know where those cool places are. It's my job as the expert to take you out and show you the cool places and to give you enough information so that you can then go explore off of it, which is what I find so amazing about Worldwide Telescope is that I can put a tour in there and show you all sorts of cool stuff in the tour, but you can stop the tour and you can start exploring around inside that tour and you can do the interactivity. But I do think that the expert narrative is, of course, always going to be necessary as well. Yeah, so to build on the narrative theme, and uh, this is more for Eric and Chris because of your involvement in Hollywood, uh, are there scientists that are influential in the narrative of these Hollywood movies from the writing perspective or the production perspective that choose you know, things like WALL-E or things like Buzz Lightyear that you know, there's these interesting space topics in science, should we make stories about this for the public? Or are these you know, situations where some creative folks say, oh, it happens to be that this year we want to do uh, something that has science. Why don't you guys build it for us? These are deep waters. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's good examples and bad examples. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, j j generally in the creation of an artistic product such as a film, of course, you will often see a scientific advisor in the credits of the movie. But we all know there are many, many bad examples <laughs> of science in Hollywood feature films. Because ultimately, the film is driven by a director. And a director is a very creative individual who has a vision about the film and the way it should evolve. Um, I personally think that you know, 
the way science is represented in films is still very much underplayed from what it could be. Can, uh, can I add on this one? I'm, yeah. in, in my civilian life, I'm a, I'm a producer of motion pictures, television, and so forth. Um, and I, it's astounding and, at how willfully ignorant studio executives can be in the area of science. I'm right now producing a film that we go to shoot next um, in, in September uh, where uh, the moon has been destroyed by an asteroid. It's bounced off onto the... Uh, uh, okay, hold on. So the, the asteroid is bounced onto Earth. Uh, this, it gets worse. It gets worse. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and, 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 and we're mining, now we're mining the, uh, um, the, the asteroid for a, for a rare element. Uh, Unobtainium. Um, Unobtainium, yeah. Uh, gosh, I forget the name of it, but it's, uh, but it's number 109. Or, um, um, and, I, and I'm trying to tell the studio executives in charge, this has to go. There's no such element that could possibly exist. If it, if it did exist, it would decay you know, um, within a nanosecond, it wouldn't be hanging around billions of years later in an in a asteroid. You can so barely forth. make those in CERN, and, and, right? you know? And yeah. it's just, it's embarrassing. And, I'm, and so for those of you who see uh, the, the forthcoming movie, there's a tiny slice of the movie, but I'm still arguing it. If it slips through, it ain't my fault, I swear to you. Well, what's, uh, okay, that's well, all. Well, what, what's, what, what's really interesting, it's almost a paradox, is that despite the often lame storylines that uh, abuse and misuse science, the actual real science behind making the visuals that create these movies is very rigorous. Um, you know, for example, just if you, you know, if you want to create um, water or fluid effects, you know, that essentially is computational fluid dynamics, you know, a well-known engineering discipline. Um, all of these effects are often done by just analyzing how scientifically things work in the real world and simulating them inside of algorithms, you know, and software is written and created by the scientists and engineers who, you know, have that view of the world. So uh, it often strikes me that, that there is a paradox between the end result in the storyline and the techniques that are actually used to deliver it. Yeah, well, uh, one thing that happens a lot, though, is the director will override that, right? So that's the common, look, guys, I know it's yeah. right, but it doesn't look right. Let's change it. You know, this is a very common thing that uh, current directors do. But uh, I guess I would just inject that, uh, you know, actually I don't, well, first of all, on a positive note, I guess there, there, is a, there is an awareness, I think, in the industry that science does need to be more accurate. There's a consortium called the Entertainment and Technology Exchange, which is a meeting and kind of a group that, uh, where it's trying to foster uh, interrelationships between science and, and Hollywood uh, features. And a lot of this happens at the writing stage and story development stage. So. There is, there is intention, good intentions do abound, um, but you know things slip through. And to be honest, I, I would hate to see bad science films go away. Um, I find them very entertaining. I mean, Mystery Science Theater would would crumble, and yeah. you know would just be be terrible. But you know, and I'll I'll let you try to figure out the film. But I just love the film where they go down to the center of the Earth, and when somebody exits the craft, and they say it's 9,000 psi. And the guy's wearing what appears to be like a little jogging suit that's all flappy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I kind of like that, actually. But, but you know, that's just me. That's yeah. probably the ultimate in uh, things. I will note that we did a panel on this yesterday called Do You Need Good Science to Have Good mm -hmm. Science Fiction? So uh, you can get a DVD copy of it out there. And two scriptwriters were on that panel, and they, could, they commented a lot on this topic. I, I was thinking that it started sounding a lot like that panel. Um, so I want to kind of bump it back to one thing and actually bring some, uh, and, and while the, um, this is about making space cool, I will say while the, in terms of scientific accuracy, you know, the Star Wars trilogy <coughs> doesn't, or trilogies, didn't necessarily do the science right from last year's panel, but it sure did make it cool. And um, I, I think that, um, that some, sometimes the making it cool uh, can inspire people to be interested in, even though the science is completely wrong. And I think that uh, Frank will probably agree on me, especially in the, sometimes you have to tell a lie for better truth. But uh, I, I, what really kills me is when, when they get the science wrong and it doesn't make it cool, it makes it stupid, right? <laughs> uh, but I think that, that to a certain degree, um, uh, the, if you're going to make it cool, um, uh, you know, making it as accurate as you can and still keeping it uh, cool and engaging and making the story so that you don't send people yawning 
and, uh, and going away when people go into a bunch of science talk, right? Uh, uh, you can communicate so much more visually by having really good science that looks great and conveys uh, beauty and, and accuracy without having to say a lot. Actually, let's, let's give credit to one movie that uh, tried to achieve that uh, because it's so on topic and on theme for this conference, which of course is the movie Contact, uh, where they had that wonderful pullback scene at the beginning. It was done by Sony Pictures Image Works, where you pull back from the Earth. The sound coming from the Earth was not synchronized to the, uh, the pullback itself, to so the visuals, you know, so you had kind of the sound of Nazi stormtroopers shouting, Seek Heil, when you're just at Jupiter. Um, but um, it worked from a point of view of conveying the sense of wonder and you know you realize that the whole of the universe everything is inside Jodie Foster's eyeball or perhaps uh, Jill Tata's in uh, this case uh, because that's where the, the shot ended up uh, you know that just I just raised that just a good example of a, of a classic sense of wonder shot that really could stimulate people all right and of course that was written by Carl Sagan so absolutely uh, yeah. you do have good science advisor on that next question yeah. Yeah, um, I'm coming at this from the viewpoint of a full dome com uh, producer. You know that, and Eric knows that. My biggest interest is when I'm getting some data that I want to be able to put in the immersive environment. Immersivity really changes things, um, changes the way we put things, where we put it in the sweet spot. And does it change the science? That's kind of a question I'm leading up to. And how do you deal with that when you are asked to work in an immersive environment? Well, for me, the camera, the, the, the preparation of the data set is usually similar for an immersive environment. Um, I mean, some of the shots that we've, we've done at Space Telescope for our press releases, we can't do in an immersive environment because you need to get more 3D. If you don't have really good th full 3D for something, if you've only got 2.5D, is what I, as I like to call it, you're not going to go into a dome very well uh, unless you just do very simple shots. Um, but the camera choreography is really complex in how you have to imagine it. I was able to get a beautiful shot of a galaxy collision where I got underneath the galaxies as they're colliding and you get the tidal tails and they're spinning and it was like a helicopter floating above the planetarium uh, for the uh, National Air and Space Museum shot I did. Uh, that was really cool. I could never do that in a flat screen. So it opens up new possibilities, but previs, previs and such, and uh, comprehending where your camera is and what it's seeing at, every, at, at all times is, is quite difficult. Uh, I'm going to give a plug here to uh, California Academy of Science, the Morrison Planetarium. Um, it, while it's, it's not exactly space, um, but uh, they, they have a new show on earthquakes. And when you talk about bringing data into an immersive environment, uh, so they're doing something, I don't know if it's been done uh, uh, before in a planetarium environment, but they have their traditional live movie show. Uh, or movie show that's a you know pre-baked uh, with all the Hollywood cinema and everything like that, and then they transition into uh, worldwide telescope with real live up to the minute earthquake data, and then they actually fly through to the various earthquakes that are happening and, and engage in that, showing real data and being able to bring in real world up to the minute events. So if the you know. In the time that the earthquake show is going to play, there's probably going to be some other major events happening on Earth, and they'll be able to actually talk to that in a way that obviously they couldn't bake into a presentation and make it a timely manner uh, for something that's rendered offline. So, um, but th that sort of um, uh, ability to bring that in, and uh, uh, Adler Planetarium did a recent show where Chris Lintott from Oxford came in with his Hubble Top 10, and they put together a show in a few days. Uh, and ran it live uh, with with uh, data that Chris Chris had ha uh, brought with him, and uh, they had some of the the comments there that it was one of the best shows that they they'd done in the planetarium, um, uh, because of the, the ability to just engage the audience and bring in the the, the, the right up to the minute uh, data into it. I'm going to try to sneak in two quick two more quick questions. Let's uh, to get them both in. Let's make the answers as brief as possible. Um, I just wanted to first say that I'm just absolutely blown away by all the work that you all do. And I was curious about what your thoughts are about how to create a potential market that reaches um, a wider audience um, for all these kinds of um, projects that you mention. 
um, especially with the natural history and bringing out science in a way that sort of bypasses the Hollywood studio system and the need for these mega budgets. Hmm. Well, I guess I'll, I'll say something on that. We're, I think it, it uh, I, I think there's huge amounts of opportunity, and I mean that's what we're trying to explore in my company. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stories to be told in very novel ways, in very powerful ways. I mean, the, the point that I use a lot is that. Um, if you look at Ansel Adams' work and some of the great landscape photographers, they changed public policies about the national parks in the 30s due to the strength of that media, of the photographic medium. But um, we all at this table and room think that digital media is also powerful, but what has it done to actually truly change the world? Well, I think it, you could easily argue that WWT and others are doing that. But I still think there's a lot of the benchmark classic cases maybe yet to happen. So I think there's great potential, but, uh, um, but I think the other thing is it, it kind of works in, as far as what technology affords or offers. So we're working on some iPad apps right now that I think I will you know, probably strike a nice chord and have some new opportunities. And we work a lot in, just like we were talking about in planetarium work, we just finished uh, work on Earthquake and uh, Griffith's new show in LA. So there's, uh, no, I think tremendous amount of opportunity. I don't know what to say other than, you know, future's pretty bright. Lourdes, would, yeah. you, would you just ask the last question and then we'll, yeah. forgive me for cutting you off on that, but I just no. want to get that last one. In. It's Sorry. just more of a comment. I have been doing some astronomy uh, outreach uh, YouTube videos and I have recently found the Worldwide Telescope and I find it an excellent tool to explain not only the science facts of the, like the solar system, but also to show and to give a tour uh, to actually see and have the actual data uh, with this image, real image, um, on screen. So that's, uh, I wanted to say that is a wonderful tool, so thank you. You're welcome. All right. Yeah. And John, can I make a plug? Sure, go ahead. Um, my mm -hmm. IMAX film, Hubble, is showing at 1.30 in the media track. Uh, I will explain for 10 or 15 minutes how we made some of those shots in the film, and then we'll play the entire film, and you can ask me any questions there. Fantastic. All right, let's have a great round of applause for our wonderful panelists. And I'm sure some of them will hang around up front if you want to just float in and ask further questions. Sean, we never talked about cryogenics, though. We were going to talk about that. <laughs> Where's the liquid helium when you need it? Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I guess I'll see her at Tucson at the ASPB. Yeah. You and.